Well, thank you. It, it's, uh, it's great to be here, and uh, it's nice that you turn the weather back to the British just for us. Thank you. <laughs> but the good news is I'm leaving tomorrow for Pretoria, so the sun will come out tomorrow. So you'll... <laughs> but it's very nice to be here, of course, for many serious reasons, particularly uh, amongst them this conference. And uh, it's uh, a good opportunity to share with you the kind of thinking that we've been doing over the years to, to essentially come to the best estimates we can of the comparative harms of drugs. And uh, that's what my talk is about today. The origins of this work um, okay, we've got it. Um, come from my, uh, my role when I was um, the government's advisor on drugs. So here's me being sacked from that role. Um, and there's the Home Secretary's hand over my mouth and the book of cannabis falling from my grasp and the scales of justice there in the bottom left-hand corner showing the argument that I was making that tobacco and uh, alcohol, certainly in the UK, were more of a problem, weighing heavier on society than whatever those strange green chemicals in the plastic bags on the other side were. That, that's the, that was the outcome uh, of nine years' work as the lead scientist on the government's drug um, council, the advisory council of misuse of drugs. I was appointed to that in 2000, um, partly because I co-authored a, a very influential report called the Runciman Report uh, in the UK in 2000. I, I was the sort of medical scientist on that report, and it, it called for a, a, a new debate, a, a rational debate about uh, drugs and drug harms. And at that time, the British government was quite interested in the concept of, um, of doing evidence-based policy. So I was appointed to chair the technical committee, the scientific committee of the advisory council. And uh, I did that on the condition that we were allowed, I was allowed to develop a proper, properly uh, transparent, a quantitative, uh, rational way of assessing the harms of drugs. And the government at the time said, well, okay, we, we'd like you to do that. And the, the, the civil servants I worked with were very keen because they knew, as many of us did, that the drug laws had grown completely um, at random uh, based on United Nations conventions which were equally unfounded in science. So for six or seven years, I developed ways uh, of assessing drug harms using uh, multiple different criteria. And uh, the result of that was that uh, we came to the conclusion that the drug laws were not exactly compliant uh, or consistent with science. And, and that's why I got sacked, because when I started explaining that fact to the government, they decided they didn't want to hear that. And um, so they got rid of me. Um, the, what had happened in the meantime, of course, is that the government had changed its attitude. It wasn't a different government. It was still a Labour government. But they had come to realise that uh, drugs were uh, politically much more ex uh, a useful tool than, uh, than telling the truth about drugs. And so political policy changed. The Labour government decided rather like the Democrats in the USA, uh, to be, the only way to get re-elected was to be harder on drugs than the Tories. So they changed their policy uh, in about 2004 and, uh, and then tried to shut down people like me who were arguing that the policy change was rather, uh, well, was not only dishonest, but also going to, in the end, be destructive. So that's me being sacked. And, of course, one of the interesting things politicians should learn is that... Um, Nothing gives people more, uh, makes people more interesting to the media than being sacked. And uh, up to that point, no one had heard of me. Now I became, a, then I became a kind of public figure. And, and actually, what was really interesting about that was that the, the, the drug debate then became a, a debate that was acceptable to have in the media. Because up to that point, very few, if any, scientists would go on onto TV and say that uh, alcohol was more harmful than cannabis, for instance. And they thought that was something that would undermine their careers. And, of course, they were right, because my sacking proved that. But 
in the end, it has to be done, and people have to stand up for the truth. And uh, now there's much more open debate, uh, even amongst the scientific community. Then the interesting thing about the sacking, you can see on the front page of this magazine, is the top left-hand corner. And there you see the other side of the drug debate. Andre Agassi's crystal meth confession. Some of you may not know who Andre Agassi was, but he, he was a very good tennis player. He was a Wimbledon champion. And uh, he tested positive for methamphetamine crystal meth when he was the world number one. And that presented the tennis authorities with a great challenge. Because they, like most organizations, uh, sporting organizations, say that drugs like methamphetamine uh, should not be used by sports people, even, even if they're not performance enhancing, which it probably wasn't. He used it recreationally, almost certainly. But in an attempt to deter the use of drugs, sports people are made um, uh, the kind of symbols of uh, cleanliness and perfection, when of course they're not. And, and they didn't, the tennis authorities didn't quite know what to do about Andre. So they did, actually, I thought they did a very English thing. They asked him to tell the truth. Andre, did you actually take crystal meth? And he said, no, of course not. Your blood tests are like your British tennis players. They're rubbish. <laughs> and, um, and they said, oh, thank goodness. Go away and never pee into a bottle again. And uh, he, he never did. And of course, um, what's interesting about that story is, of course, that if you are very, very, very important, you can get away with anything. Uh, Lance Armstrong, you know, you win the Tour de France seven years in a row. They don't bother to test you for blood doping or erythropoietin. But as soon as you come second, you're out. And um, so there is one law for the very famous and the very uh, sportingly able and one law for the others. And that was rather uh, better discussed by uh, Ethan yesterday. But it also raises an interesting question. Why, why did he sell his book on this confession? Why didn't he sell his book? I, oh, two times Wimbledon champion. You know. No, he didn't bother. He sold his book because people were more interested in drugs than tennis. And, and that's, that's why we're having this discussion here today, of course, because, uh, because, again, as Ethan pointed out yesterday, almost everyone, everyone in this room has taken a drug today, I bet. You've all had tea or coffee. You know, those are, those are drugs. They affect your brain. We know how they affect your brain. We know they affect the same chemical systems in your brain as drugs like crystal meth. But, uh, but they're legal and crystal meth is not because... Uh, they do it to a lesser extent, and they're socially sanctioned. So this is a dangerous topic, and I just hope that um, when I leave this room, I won't be sent somewhere else uh, other than the courtroom in Pretoria. So Anyway, that was then in 2009. I was pretty sure I was right then. I've now become convinced I was right, because no lesser person than President Obama pointed out that, in fact, cannabis was less dangerous than alcohol just a few years ago. Now, this was a truly remarkable statement. Uh, it's remarkable for many reasons. It's remarkable because it's probably the first time in history an American president has told the truth about drugs. And, uh, and that's an enormously significant change in a, American policy. And, of course, it was driven by the uh, fear that the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency in the States, was going to start a civil war on the states which were, uh, had brought in medical marijuana, and, and the DEA would begin to close down cannabis pharmacies. And Obama did not want the will of the people to be overruled by the uh, desires of the DEA to stay uh, in power. But it was, another, it was also a really important statement, because it was really the first time that America accepted it, it no longer had the authority to dictate drug policies around the rest of the world. Because if you can't keep Californians under control, you really don't have any moral authority to keep South Africans or British under control. And uh, so th that really means that we're in a new era. The influence of the USA in terms of the UN and the WHO has not disappeared, but it, it is certainly for the first time in history, it's challengeable. And in fact, I went to Geneva in uh, 
December last year to try to persuade the expert committee on drug dependence to do what they should have done many years ago and review the health benefits of cannabis. And although they didn't do it then, they have promised they will do it next year. So we are hopefully beginning to move on the international front as well as in the US. So that's a bit of a prelude to what I'm going to talk about today. And um, I'm not entirely sure. Do I need to point this somewhere? Oh, that's better. Yes. OK. So let's talk about the, the issues relating to drugs and drug control and how we can assess uh, the, the policies that we use. So these are the reasons drugs are controlled. Drugs are controlled because they're harmful, or they might be harmful. A lot of drug control, of course, is driven by the media. There are very few things the media can influence in life anymore, but drugs uh, and drug policy is one of them. Politicians openly, generally, are in favor of drug control, even though when you speak to them privately, they realize it's actually uh, not doing, the, the law is not doing what they would hope it to do, but it's too dangerous politically to, to confront the established uh, status quo. And of course, some of the public um, want drugs controlled as well. And there are four key issues that we have to reflect on when we are considering the harms of drugs. And today I've only got time to talk about the first one, the relative harms of drugs, and particularly in comparison with legal drugs like alcohol and tobacco. But there are f three others which are important, and you might want to reflect on these as well. And the first is the proportionality of harms of drugs in relation to other risky activities. And then, of course, the proportionality of penalties to the harms of drugs. And then finally, the benefit-harm equation of the law. And these really do need to be properly evaluated, but I, we haven't got time to do it today, and I don't really have uh, much expertise, certainly in the last two. But if we're going to control drugs on the basis of uh, legal sanctions, then we need to get, I think, appropriate uh, estimates of harms. And of course, this is difficult because the very illegality of drugs means that data collection is uh, less than perfect. And, uh, and of course, there are also another, other issues which are coming along, such as new entrants into the field, like legal highs and synthetic cannabinoids where the novelty means that uh, we have very low exposures and therefore uncertain estimates of harm. Now, when you are in a situation where there is relatively poor data, uh, the best way of trying to come to some consensus, it turns out, is using this technique called multi-criteria decision analysis, or MCDA. And this paper, uh, which we published in 2010, emerged from the first paper I published in 2007, or so in The Lancet, which uh, used uh, a nine-point scale that I had developed empirically as part of the Runciman Report to assess the harms of drugs. And that pub when that paper was published, I was approached by uh, Larry Phillips, who is the, the doyen of multi-criteria decision analysis at the London School of Economics. And he said, great paper, Dave, but you could do better, you could use this MCDA technique, which I'd never heard of. And he approached me and he approached one of the other authors of the report who happened to be the head of the MRC in Britain at the time, Colin Blakemore. And he persuaded me and Colin that the, the way forward was to do an MCDA. And, and so at that time I was still working for the Home Office and the Home Office funded a uh, study to develop what is you see on this slide here, which is the decision tree. Now, the way we achieved this was to have a conference of all the experts on the Advisory Council of the Misuse of Drugs, which at that time was about 40 people. And we took them to a hotel in the countryside. We locked them in for the weekend, and we said to them, think of every possible harm a drug can do and write it on a sticky note. And then we stuck the sticky notes all around the room. We had thousands of these sticky notes. And then over those two days, we condensed them down uh, into what turned out to be 16 uh, harms. And you can see the, the top branches are the harms to the user. There are nine harms that drugs can do to users. And the bottom, there are seven harms that drugs can do to others or to society. 
And, uh, and then having decided that, we then had to come up with definitions of each. And, uh, and, uh, and then we uh, convened a separate conference after I had been sacked to analyze drugs using this uh, approach. So just a few words about the MCDA approach. It's now accepted as the best approach to deal with questions for which the scales of assessment are very different. So just if we just go back, you can see that the, the measures, for instance, at the top there, the measures of drug-specific mortality, the likelihood of a drug killing you every time you take it, that measure is a, is a, a fraction of the proportion of people who take it. But you go to the bottom one, whatever that is, that's uh, community damage. The measure of community damage from drug use is a, is a completely different measure. It's a measure of opinion uh, amongst people. It's not a measure of number in, a, uh, in relation to users. So these are, these are completely different scales. You can't use the same uh, metrics for each of them. So you have to use this technique of MCDA. And here are the people who uh, developed this theory. And uh, uh, it's become extraordinarily useful. Industry uses it a lot to make uh, decisions about uh, future planning. It was used by the British government in an enormous public consultation exercise to decide how we dealt with nuclear waste, another very controversial area, almost as controversial as drug use. It has a, a very proven process and a proven utility. And this is just a little joke to show you how it works. Here you see it. Here we have Gold Hill established whatever that was, and this screen's gone, by the way, so I can't see what I'm talking about, but I'll try to do my best at distance. So established, what was it, 1859, elevation 843 feet, population 18, total eight. Now that's a kind of pointless sum, <laughs> but that's what, that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to add these different uh, variables together. So, we convened this conference, we, um, oh, maybe it's that, maybe I switched it off accidentally with leaning on it. it was, we took 20 drugs, we took drugs which are widely used in the UK, we took drugs which were coming into the UK, like methadone, and, um, and we took um, legal drugs like alcohol and tobacco, we took prescription drugs like buprenorphine and heroin, and non-prescription drugs like crack and LSD. So it's a range of drugs, all of which uh, have uh, use and about which people are concerned. And the way it works is that those 16 variables, those 16 criteria or parameters, are each scored on a 0 to 100 scale. Uh, so essentially the group has to decide which group, which drug is at the top of that scale for each of those 16 variables. And then all the others are scaled according to the relative harm that they have in comparison with the top one. So if the expert group decided that uh, a drug was half as harmful as the most harmful drug, then it gets a score of 50. And if it's a tenth as harmful, it gets a score of 10. And if it's got no harm, it gets a score of zero. So this produces ratio scales for each of the criteria. And that's why we can compare across those very, very different kinds of measures. Now, one of the hardest measures we have uh, are deaths from drugs. And this is the data we had in 2009 when we were doing this assessment. In the UK, our tobacco was killing about 80,000 people a year of premature deaths, 80,000. Alcohol ran about 8,000, opiates just over 1,000. And then cocaine about 150, amphetamines about 40. Cannabis, ecstasy, methadone, virtually none. So it, it's... Pretty obvious that um, in terms of mortality, tobacco is the drug that is 
has the greatest impact. For those of you who can't see, that's kind of this kind of thing. One of the interesting questions is, if we're trying to bring in policies to affect the harms of drugs, is this sensible in relation to the harms uh, caused by other activities which are also uh, potentially preventable? And here you see deaths, potentially preventable deaths from other disorders. So melanoma, about 2,000 deaths. You know, you could insist that no one went out onto the beach and sunbathed. That would reduce quite a lot of melanomas. But we don't do that. We just try to warn people. Road traffic accidents, 2,500, of which about half are alcohol-related. And we try to do something about that. Suicide, very difficult to, to intervene. But quite a lot of those are alcohol-related. And AIDS in Britain, about 400. So in terms of preventable deaths, there's no question alcohol and tobacco are the ones that are at the top of the list. They're the most tractable uh, deaths that uh, for potentially for uh, intervention, political or medical intervention. Let me give you an example of how we score these criteria. So these are 16 criteria, and I've chosen two because they illustrate uh, particularly the challenge of tobacco. So on the left, you have drug-specific mortality. That is defined as the likelihood of that drug killing you every time you use it. So not surprisingly, the red arrow number two, the drug number two, heroin, scores 100. Because every time you inject heroin, you could die. And you see number six, tobacco, and number eight, cannabis, they score zero. As far as we know, no one's ever died the first or any time they've smoked a cigarette or smoked a spliff. But when you go to the right-hand side, drug-related mortality, you see heroin is still number one. This is the likelihood of you, the way you use the drug and the consequences of using the drug killing you. And then you see tobacco moves right up. Tobacco moves up to 90. Because half of all the people who smoke die of a smoking-related disorder. And there again, cannabis um, scores more than zero, but a lot less than tobacco. So those are examples of two of those uh, 16 measures. And we had to score all of them for all 20 drugs. So it's a lot of work. Uh, but you do learn a lot uh, from in the process of doing it. And that's one thing I should say. This process, this MCDA process, is by far and away the best process for getting people to understand what they know and what they don't know and what they think they know and what we know they don't know about drugs. I don't think it's possible now to do any sensible assessment of complex issues, particularly drug issues, without using the MCDA approach because you will, otherwise you will be biased by individuals' particular expertise and particular prejudices. This is, a, this is the greatest learning process that I've actually ever had the pleasure of taking part in. And that's one of the reasons we carry on doing it. Because if you want to understand a topic, this really makes, this digs, help, means that you can dig into it at a level that almost no, in, no individual can, because it's a group process. There's another interesting metric about drug harms. And um, this comes from a more recent paper by uh, Jürgen Rem, who's a leading epidemiologist of drugs. And it's, he works with this toxicologist called Latchmayer. And they have applied toxicological measures to the harms of drugs. And they've developed this measure they call the MOE, the Margin of Exposure Approach. And this is the ratio between the amount of drug people use on an individual basis at a time and the known toxicology of the drug. And that's a log scale. So I'll show you the next graph on a linear scale, which makes it a bit more easy to understand. But you'll see that alcohol turns out to be the drug with the lowest margin of exposure. Many of you will drink a bottle of wine a night, maybe more. Uh, and two or certainly three bottles can kill young people, particularly small women. So that margin of exposure is the order of two to three. 
And at the top, of course, is cannabis, where the margin of exposure is way over uh, uh, 100. So the, this graph shows it, as I say, on a linear scale. And uh, alcohol and heroin, very risky drugs. The dose d d people use compared with the lethal dose is less than 10. And in fact, if you apply current European toxicological guidelines to alcohol. If alcohol, if you treat alcohol as a food additive, like a coloring, suppose you were going to invent alcohol today, and you were going to say, I have this wonderful additive we can put into our trifles to make them taste better. Uh, and then you went to the Food Standards Agency in Europe, and you said, how much can people use of this substance in a year? They would test alcohol the same way as they test food colorants and other additives like benzene and pyridine and, that, and contaminants in food. And they would come back to you, as they have, and they say, the maximal uh, allowable consumption of ethyl alcohol in one year is 50 mils. Now, we all drank more than that last night. <laughs> and we will tonight. And... The interesting thing about this is that alcohol has had such a privileged position in our society that we have chosen and we consistently choose to ignore the known harms uh, in favor of the pleasure it gives us. And that's fine, as long as you know what you're doing. But I think it's really important that we should be objective when we do this and not pretend somehow that alcohol is not as harmful as it is, and try to demonize other drugs because uh, we consider them in a different way. So you can see there that cannabis is way, way less dangerous per use than any of these other drugs. Of course, one of the other variables is the likelihood of harming yourself or others through road traffic accidents. So these are what we call drug-related harms. And this is a very important report that was published just a couple of years ago by Kim Wolfe, who's a toxicologist at King's College in London. And it was written for the government, and uh, it looks at all the evidence we have on the harms of drugs and driving. And here's a graph from that report, which shows that being stoned doubles your risk of a road traffic accident. Being drunk increases your risk eightfold. <coughs> And the two together increase uh, our additive, and they increase the risk up to about 12-fold. Uh, so there's no question that drugs do impact on road safety, but very few drugs have the Im negative impact that alcohol has. Now, of course, one of the big questions and the big secular changes in drug use in my lifetime, <coughs> is illustrated on this graph, which is the phenomenal change in the use of cannabis. <coughs> now, when I started as a doctor in 1971, about half a million people in Britain had used cannabis. And when they stopped collecting these data back in about 2004, it, about 10 million people had used it. So we had a 20-fold increase in the number of users. And that will translate conservatively, probably into a 50-fold or a 100-fold increase in the amount used. And the same is true in every Western country. Now, you might imagine, therefore, that uh, a 20-fold increase in use, if the drug was particularly harmful, would lead to a very significant increase in problems. Well, I showed you there are virtually no deaths, and the justification for keeping cannabis illegal in the UK has largely been driven by the driving concern, which was exploded by that previous report, and by this uh, hope by governments that it causes schizophrenia, and therefore this would be a justification for keeping it illegal. Now, this is... Uh, been a very debated issue amongst uh, psychiatrists and epidemiologists. 
I think we can say pretty clearly that um, cannabis doesn't cause schizophrenia. Um, it certainly can make people have psychotic experiences that are like schizophrenia, and it certainly can aggravate schizophrenia. But when we look at the UK data, which we did uh, in order to really try to address this question, we found a surprising thing. Uh, these are data from the Medical Research Council's GP databases, and, and it looks at, these look at the incidence uh, at the bottom and the prevalence at the top of schizophrenia and other psychoses. And you can see that over the period when that 20-fold increase in cannabis use or users was occurring, there was no increase in schizophrenia or in psychosis. If anything, it's falling. And in fact, really, it's very, very difficult to argue for the criminalization of cannabis users on the grounds that you're protecting them from schizophrenia. In fact, it's wrong. Uh, if, if you want to, the only data we have, which is a Swedish conscript study, uh, which shows there is a, some increased incidence of schizophrenia potentially in cannabis users, if you believe that data, uh, then we estimated you've got to stop 5,000 young men from ever uh, using cannabis to stop one case of schizophrenia and 7,000 young women. And that is not a tractable public health approach to schizophrenia. In fact, the whole cannabis debate is a massive, massive smokescreen. It's a political debate. It's not helping any of us practicing psychiatrists deal with the problems of schizophrenia. And it's largely been used in the UK, at least, as a justification for keeping the drug illegal. Now, of course, the MCDA process doesn't just give you uh, scales or ratio scales for the comparative harms of the different drugs on those 16 different parameters. Uh, well, it gives you that. But it also gives you the opportunity to, to decide in terms of policy outcomes, what you care about. Because each of those variables uh, is a different dimension. And some societies might really care very little about some of them and might care an awful lot about others. And so the second step in the process is the weighting process, where you take each criterion and then you decide how much you care about it. And what you do is you essentially decide how much you care about that difference between the most harmful and the least harmful for each of those 16 criteria of harm. So as you can see, this is why these processes, these conferences take several days, because there's an awful lot of thinking and decision making. But it's, in the end, you have to give comparative weights to each of those. And the way we do it is using the decision tree. We, we take different sections and compare them and then compare the uh, most, uh, the one that's weighted most highly from each of the sections and compare it with each of the others. So let me give you an example, make it simple. So here are the harms to others. These are the seven variables that we ranked, uh, the harms to others. Crime, environmental damage, family adversity, international damage, economic cost, and community. And at the top there, you see the drugs that our expert panel decided were the most, or the most harmful on those. So heroin for crime, environmental damage for alcohol, family adversity for alcohol, etc. And at the bottom are the ones we consider the least harmful. And then we decided what we cared about. Which one did we care about most? And in our group, interestingly, they thought the economic cost of drugs was the greatest. So you can see economic cost is scored as 100, the bottom uh, series of uh, boxes. And then all the others were scaled against economic costs. So we, we thought crime was 80% as important as economic cost, environmental damage only 30%, family adversity 70%, international damage 30%, etc. When you do, do that, you then... adjust the, the scores on the others according 
to that fraction. So you downgrade the others as a fraction of the, the 100 you score, we scored for economic cost. And in the end, you come up with a, a series of scores, and here are the scores. So overall, our group decided economic cost was the most important, followed by injury, the injury caused by drugs, and then the crime, and then the family adversity, and then the mortality, and then the dependence, all the way down to community damage. And having done all that, you then uh, use the computer program called HiView, and it produces uh, outputs for all the different drugs. And this is the graph that uh, you've hopefully all seen by now, the graph we published in The Lancet. It's color-coded so that the blue bars are the relative harms to the user of the different drugs, and the red bar are the relative harms to others. And I have to say, to my surprise, I'd never done this process before, to my surprise, alcohol came out as the most harmful drug. And the reason for that is, of course, this enormous red bar. And the red bar is the economic cost of alcohol, which is about 20 billion pounds a year in Britain for lost work, about 7 billion pounds a year for policing, about 4 billion pounds a year for healthcare costs, and all the other costs such as family uh, adversity, <coughs> child sexual abuse, etc. The very interesting comparison, actually, is if you go along, go along to number four, methamphetamine, you see there, there's a tiny red bar. And that's because we don't have much methamphetamine use in Britain. It has very little impact on our society. The crystal meth, the methamphetamine but, uh, blue bar to users means it's very harmful alongside heroin and crack, the next two on the left. But because there's relatively little use, it's uh, not a particularly interesting or it's not, not, not a particular, as harmful as uh, those other drugs in the UK. And you see cannabis comes out of, in the middle there, and drugs that the press like to vilify, like magic mushrooms and ecstasy, they come out very, very low. Low in terms of harm to the user, and extremely low in, low in terms of the harm to society. And based on that, uh, I have argued and continue to argue that where drug policy in the UK should be targeted is certainly alcohol, and we still allow alcohol advertising on our TV. We've banned tobacco advertising, but we allow alcohol advertising. And of course, then along, you have the next two along, which are crack uh, and heroin. And the obsession that governments have with cannabis and other drugs like mushrooms is really, uh, I think it's a smokescreen to deflect, deflect attention away from the problems of alcohol. And I have little doubt that the alcohol industry is encouraging uh, people to look away from the harms of alcohol. Well, this became an extremely famous graph. In fact, it's the only piece of work I've ever done. It's turned into a cartoon, which I rather like. You know. Here's a couple of cowboys who are drunk and smoking camels. <laughs> well, people said, OK, well, that's just Nutt and his cronies coming up with some kind of pre-planned uh, output, which, of course, is completely false. This process is impossible to game. It's so complicated. You can, you know, when you're talking about 16 variables in 20 drugs, you have enormous complexity. Even com be difficult even for uh, artificial intelligence to game it. But nevertheless, we thought it was important to find out whether how generally true it was. So, and as did the European Department of Justice. So they funded us to do another study in Europe. Repeat the study. Uh, this time with 30 European experts from 20 European countries. Uh, and many of these European countries have quite different issues. So Norway and Czech Republic, they have a much bigger methamphetamine problem than we have in Britain. Others have bigger cannabis problems, etc. So we went to Brussels, we convened a conference, we did the same thing again. And the European experts, they changed every single the ratio, they send the position of drugs on every single one of those 16 scales. They change the weightings of, uh, of every one of those scales in comparison with us. And the final results were amazing because they were almost identical to the UK one. In fact, I challenge any of you to tell which 
what the difference is. One drug moved its position, that was actually GHB. But the correlation between these two separate groups of experts is 0.995, which for this kind of what you might call social science research is unheard of. And here's the correlation. So what we can say now, I think quite categorically, that this is an exceptionally robust process. That if you analyze the harms of drugs in this fashion, uh, you're very likely to come to very similar conclusions. However, there is still the opportunity to do it in other countries, and one of the things I'm hoping that might happen here is that you might rise to the challenge and think about doing an MCDA here in South Africa. We're going to do one in Australia, hopefully in, uh, in April next year. And only when you've done that will you be in a really confident position to know that whether your current attitudes and policies on drugs are really evidence-based. I thought it might be useful in the context of some of the discussions which are going on in the country at present in relation also to the court case, just to have a simple comparison of cannabis and alcohol. And these are the nine harms to users. These are the scores of the UK group for cannabis and alcohol in relation to those nine harms to others, drug-specific mortality, drug-related mortality, etc., etc. And you can see on all of those, with the exception of dependence, where they both score the same, which is probably being a little generous to alcohol, that <laughs> cannabis is less harmful than alcohol on all those. And when you look at the harms to society, to others, then you see that cannabis is very, very less harmful than alcohol. Now, of course, part of that is driven by the fact that alcohol is more widely used in cannabis. So I think we can uh, be less secure in the translation of that data in a different environment. But this data, I think we can be very secure. It's, ver it's very unlikely that wherever cannabis is used is, is going to turn out to be more harmful than alcohol. And overall, we scored it about a third less harmful than alcohol. But you can use this MCDA approach to do other things. You can use it, as I'm going to show you now, to look at the comparative harms of different formulations of the same drug. We've done it, I won't talk about this, but we've done it for prescription opiates, uh, which is interesting in the context of diversion. And more interestingly for today, we've done it for nicotine delivery systems. And uh, a couple of years ago, we got an international expert panel to look at a range of nicotine products using the same 16 points, although in fact, two of them weren't relevant, so it's a 14 point scale. And here are the results published a couple of years ago showing that cigarettes are the most harmful. The green bar is a harm to the user. Uh, the red bar is a harm to society. And one of the most remarkable things I learned in this process was the harms to others for cigarettes. It's not just passive smoking. It's the fact that cigarettes are responsible for half of all the fires in the world. Because people throw butts out. And, uh, and that's why the harms to others are so large. And here you see that vaping e-cigarettes, or ENDS, electronic nicotine delivery systems, about 5% of the harms of cigarettes. And that figure has been, um, has become the established now norm for comparative harms of these products. The Public Health England did a very detailed review of e-cigarettes a couple of years ago. They relied on this data, but they also collated seven other studies, uh, not MCGA studies, but other studies of harm, uh, more toxicological studies, and they came to the conclusion that e-cigarettes are of the order of 1 40th as harmful as uh, cigarettes. And this has uh, underpinned the massive commitment of the British uh, health system to eliminating cigarette smoking through e-cigarettes. In fact, they're now prescription medicine in Wales. People who want to stop smoking but can't can now be prescribed e-cigarettes. 
One of the reasons I'm showing you the cigarette data is because this is where we have South African data. So we haven't got South African MCDA data for other drugs, but just a few months ago, in June this year, a group of South African experts did a tobacco products MCDA here in Johannesburg. And they came to very similar conclusions. The social harms, the red bars of different forms, were scored somewhat higher than the, uh, the experts we had put together for the UK meeting. But overall, the conclusions are very similar. And I show you that not only to emphasize that whatever policies you have here around cigarettes should definitely not get in the way of encouraging people to switch to vaping. But I also show it to you because it shows that it, South African experts are indistinguishable from others. So if you did want to do a more detailed MCD analysis, I think the rest of the world would be very interested in your outcomes. I want to finish by moving on to another field, which we, un, this is unpublished data, and it's uh, an even more challenging direction, but it addresses the question of, well, it's all very well to come up with the harms of drugs, but what you're doing is you're looking at the harms of drugs in an environment, in a political and health environment, which is fixed. To what extent does the nature of that environment affect the harms? People always ask me, well, okay, alcohol is more harmful than cannabis, but if cannabis was legal and everyone smoked cannabis, what would happen? Well, there'd be more harm from cannabis, obviously. So the really interesting question now is to what extent are the policies we use contributing to the harms? And how can we evaluate the effects of different policies? And we've done this, and as I say, this is, um, it's not yet published. First time I've actually shown the data, so I'll be interested in your take on it. We were funded to do this by uh, the Norwegian Institute for Alcohol and Drug Research. Norway, a bit like South Africa, ha is a country that has had a very prohib prohibitionist approach to drugs, has come to the realization that, that may not be the best way of doing things, so there's a big debate in Norway at present as to how best to approach uh, drug control. They have, as I've said already, rising use of methamphetamine. They have a, a disproportionate number of heroin deaths because they have hardly begun to introduce harm reduction measures. So they funded uh, this institute, uh, Ole Rogerberg is the economist who's a professor there, to do a series of studies, one of which was to work with us and see whether we could develop uh, an MCDA on policy. So we did it. Again, it takes two, two separate conferences to do this. The first is to work out what the, the policy, what the impacts of different policies might be. What are the areas of society that are impacted by uh, drug policy? And then the second one to see how different drugs would be affected by those different policies. So it turns out this is really challenging. It turns out there are actually 27 policy evaluation criteria. There are 27 criteria that you can see on this decision tree here that are affected by drug policy. Health, there's a group of health issues, there are social issues, there are political issues, there's public issues, there's crime, economic issues, and there are the costs of the policy. So this is, this is hugely challenging. 27 is a lot of variables to deal with. Firstly, we have to define them all, and here I'm not going to go through this, but we've defined each of them in terms of the impact of policy to maximize the benefits to society. So this is the obverse of what we did before. The previous scores were looking at the harms of drugs, and what you're going to see now are scales which look at the benefits of policy. So now up is better, not worse. Having done that, we decided we, there, were, uh, there are many different forms of policy. There are complicated, uh, almost infinite number of forms of policy. We decided to, to look at four relatively discrete ones that we'd all understand. Complete prohibition at the top in red and a completely liberal market with no controls at the bottom. 
and then in between the yellow state control where you have a regulated access uh, and you have amounts determined by uh, the state, etc., and taxation, and then a decriminalized uh, market in uh, orange. So those are four relatively discrete kinds of policies, and we know quite a lot about all of them because we know about absolute prohibition for many drugs. We know about complete laissez-faire access to drugs, uh, particularly in some countries with alcohol. And we know about state control for alcohol, and we know about decriminalization. So they're not they're concepts which we have some understanding of. So this is such a complicated process, we were only able to do it for three drugs. And I'm going to start off by showing you the results for cannabis. And they're here. And uh, what you see is that on the right-hand side there, the right-hand arrow, absolute prohibition is way the worst. And state control is the best. It's significant, or well, it's definitely better than the free market, and it's quite a lot better than decriminalization. And the colors there tell you uh, where the differences are. And you can see the state control is better because of the bigger bar, it's better for health. That's the largest one. And uh, it's also better for uh, public and public behavior. So this is the first systematic attempt to work out what the appropriate market for cannabis might look like. And what's interesting, of course, and you'll hear later on from Raquel, that this is the kind of market that Uruguay have decided on. They've lib legal markets of cannabis exist in Uruguay, they exist in the Netherlands, uh, and to, in a similar way to some extent in, in Spain, etc. So this kind of state control, regulated cannabis market seems to have the best health benefits, or the best benefits to society generally. Uh, I won't go into that. These are the different variables that, uh, it's not always the way, so that's just to show you that if, Decriminalization compared with state control. There are some, and there are always some benefits because there are these 27 variables. Some of them will always be better than others. In, uh, in, and in this case, decriminalization is somewhat better on, on just one of those variables, whereas state control is better on almost all of them. <coughs> and here's alcohol. Alcohol is rather different. It still comes out that state control is the most appropriate. Uh, the completely free market, where you don't have any age control, where you don't have any constrictions on when and where people sell, does not do as well. Decriminalization and absolute prohibition are also not as good. So I think we all agree that some kind of state control of alcohol is what we do and what we should do. This is evidence that what we're doing is right. And uh, I think what I've shown you is that certainly for cannabis, a similar kind of profile will be will give the best outcomes to society. And for cannabis, just to repeat, absolute prohibition seems to be particularly problematic because of the, the fact it maximizes negative health impacts and maximizes negative social impact, etc. So I want to stop now. I'll re remind you that... Uh, if you do have a copy of the book, I'll sign it. We're going to Pretoria first thing tomorrow morning, so I'd be, like to sign it today if possible. And uh, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you very much.